This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Sacred Geography. Why do some locations appear to be more supernatural than others? Straight ahead on A View from the Bunker. Space is not the final frontier, but there are those who want you to think it is. 75 years ago, something crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. An industry has grown up to sell the idea that the pilots were extraterrestrials. We want you to know the truth. For a limited time, we're making available a special offer featuring the groundbreaking book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. This book shows step-by-step step how the occult teachings of Madame Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley grew into the ancient aliens hypothesis of the modern UFO movement. It's our Gilbert House Roswell Special. For just $35, we'll send you The Day the Earth Stands Still, plus our DVD sets, The Best of Sci Friday, Volumes 1 and 2. It's a $65 value for just $35. Take advantage of the Gilbert House Roswell Special for a limited time only, and you'll only find it at our store, online at gilberthouse.org. It's time once again for our monthly series featuring... Uh, other out-of-the-box thinkers as we try to explore some of the deeper things of this supernatural war in which we all find ourselves. Uh, first, the pastor of... Um I'd scrolled down and I lost his uh, bio info. There we are. Pastor of the Reformed Baptist Church of Northern Colorado in Boulder. Uh, we uh, also appreciate his uh, writing, uh, Giant Sons of the Gods, Conspiracy Theory, and most recently co-author of The Angel of the Lord, a Biblical, Historical, and Theological Study, uh, Pastor Doug Van Dorn, and our friendly neighborhood PhD, Director of the Institute of Biblical Anthropology, author of Interview with the Giant, Elect Ethno-Historical Notes on the Nephilim, and uh, you'll, find, you'll see the links to their websites, uh, come up on the screen here as they join us uh dr judd burton uh doug judd thank you for joining us uh, again this week sadly we'll be without brian gadawa this week last minute uh, schedule complication yeah, he's kind of a bomb he just shot that on us like 30 minutes <laughs> no, no. We'll let, we'll let it slide this one time. if it wasn't bad enough that he's a partial preterist i mean this this uh, <laughs> this puts him over the top man yeah. well some just, there's so many different topics, interesting topics that we could dive into. This this one just occurred to me uh, this past week, and so I'm glad you guys are both on board. And Judd, I know this is right up your alley, so I'm going to throw this one to you first. We see references in the Bible to a number of locations that uh, seem to be especially important when it comes to um, supernatural events. I mean, Mount Hermon is one, and uh, you did your dissertation on uh, the uh, the Grotto of Pan or Benias at the base of Mount Hermon. Uh, but in a broader sense, not necessarily focusing on Mount Hermon, why are there certain areas that seem to be, um, can we use the por word portals? I mean, hubs of supernatural activity? Sure. Well, that's certainly one way to look at it. Um, sort of the just the strict scholastic approach to sacred geography is that there has to be sacred activity there in order for it to be designated as such, or it has to be associated with some sort of uh, supernatural event or, or chain of events. And you certainly have all of those at, at a site like Mount Hermon or, uh, or uh, Panaeus as well. Uh, now, as to whether I think that these could be portals, uh, Yes, absolutely. I, I don't see any reason why they couldn't, particularly if you've got, um, you know, as in the case at, at Panaeus, you had centuries, if not millennia, uh, well, millennia of, of these uh, um, ceremonies to a god with many different faces. Uh, so it, it's, it's hard to figure out if it's a chicken or the egg sort of question with the in the case of a portal, was the portal there first, or was that it and it attract people there for ceremony and ritual, or did it come about as some sort of uh, cosmic brokerage um, brought on by the the ritual and ceremony? Doug, one of the spots that uh, we find really interesting. We're looking forward to getting back there and. Um... I know you've been back, uh, and you wrote about it first, so credit where it's due, and that's the uh, the Serpent Mound of Bashan. We've done a program on that here on this uh, this show, but uh, 
that seems to have had some special significance, even though it's not uh, biblical, but uh, certainly with all of the, um, uh, I think the Isra- Israel Antiquities Authorities documented something like 140 megalithic tombs on the back of this three-quarter mile long serpent-shaped ridge, just a quarter of a mile from Gilgal Rephaim, which itself is a significant location. And uh, you can't leave out that it's, uh, what, 20 miles from Mount Hermon? You can plainly see it on the northern horizon when you're there. Um, what what's your what are your thoughts on this? So why why are certain geographic locations the focus of ritual activity? So um, I think I told you guys that I wanted to brush up on my David Flynn for uh, <laughs> for this discussion, and um, you know he's been he's been gone from us now for almost I think a decade, um, maybe even a little longer than that, and. Um, this is the guy that first got me thinking about sacred geography, even before Heiser was really writing about it, at least that I saw. And he, he has some really interesting takes on just kind of the way that he believes. And I, I think that the um, esoterica, um, kind of occult, um, mystical religions, and, you know, as a Christian, he would say certainly uh, the Bible as well. How, how God really made this world, uh, focusing, having the heavens mirror the earth, um, having, uh, you know, g- going going to the divine council worldview for a moment, um, that God would divide these sons of gods up and give them portions of land. And like, who gets what and how is that decided? And and um, where do they go? And uh there's a, there's some really interesting stuff that I think we could maybe explore with this, t- with relation to the stars, um, the gods that might be behind those stars, um, why they're in certain places, why the worship of one god might predominate in one place over another place, and then of course that that could all come back pretty easily to Mount Hermon and the watchers coming down on on very interesting latitudes and longitudes. Mm-hmm. Um, that are, you know, somehow in this marriage of the heaven and the earth, they're they're wed together. And the ancient peoples knew this, and they knew that um, there was significant spiritual activity that was associated with it. Perhaps they thought they could control it. Um, certainly the worship of those gods in those places becomes very important to them. Where they're putting their uh, megaliths and their structures is completely related to this kind of stuff. So I don't know. I just I think that it, it I think there's something going on uh, with how God made this universe and how He made the earth and and the sky to mirror one another. That I just think that we haven't thought about this for so long, and in some ways it's kind of been um, turned into something that you shouldn't even think about or talk about. But it's not something that has to lead you in some kind of a gnostic or evil direction. It's if this is the way God really made the earth, then. We could expect that the Bible would uh, represent this and it would talk about it in a way that is uh, biblical and godly and right. And and I think it would behoove us to think well about that. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, David Flynn deserves credit more than he gets. Uh, and yeah, does. Partly, he's he's been gone for a while, but uh, back in the day, um, he, his uh, book Temple at the Center of Time, which I... I tried getting my head around when it came out back in 2008 <laughs> and uh I, I guess i wasn't ready for it then i'm st- I just now digging into it and just already seeing things just in the scan the skimming that i did this evening um that uh Interesting. yeah f- uh, but but his his article uh, and we sharon and i interviewed him a few times back in um uh, our old pid radio broadcast or our podcast and back in 2005 he wrote an article an occult translation of the roswell event Mm, yep, yep. And this was this was absolutely mind blowing in terms of the latitude and longitude of what happened at Roswell. And as we're recording this here, Fourth uh, of July weekend in in twenty twenty two, it's the seventy fifth <laughs> right. anniversary of the Roswell event. I hadn't really planned that, but uh, it it was just stunning. And I'm going to put a link to this in the notes. So if you're watching or listening to this podcast, check the show notes wherever you're you're hearing this or or seeing this to get a link to the because uh, that article is still online and the interviews that we've done with david about the occult symbolism of the roswell crash plus uh, other interviews that we were blessed to do with him about uh, 
the book of Daniel at Washington, DC. Like what? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and the stuff in, in temple at the center of time, which I, I, again, I don't even remember reading this back in the day, but I, I highlighted a few things. If I can tap the right part of the screen here and, and try to get it, eh, the bookmarks notes. There we go. Um, Measurement from the center point, and, and he's, again, in the book of Daniel here, and uh, talking about the uh, night when uh, the the handwriting on the wall appeared at the party of Belshazzar, which was the night that Babylon was destroyed in 539 BC. You uh, measure from the point of uh, the temple's foundation in Jerusalem to the palace of, uh, at the political center of Babylon, the, uh, the, the palace of Belshazzar, uh, it's uh, 539- 0.86 statute miles, 539.86. Well, it was October of 539 BC when Babylon was destroyed. But then further, he said, okay, and then now look at the prophecies of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, who was uh, received his revelation uh, at the Kivar Canal, which runs through the city of Nippur, which was where the temple of Enlil, the chief god of Mesopotamia, was located. And um, this was uh, 587 nauti- or, uh, statute miles from the temple in Jerusalem. Well, the fall of Jerusalem took place in 587 BC. It's like, okay. And this is the kind of thing that David was doing. And he, it, the, the connection to the Roswell event is even more stunning. So again, uh, how, how do we wrap our heads around this as Christians? I mean, how does this fit into a biblical worldview? So he talks about um, things like uh, he'll take the platonic solids. um, He'll take like a a four-sided pyramid and then he'll take a, uh, which is the simple, the simplest uh, three-dimensional structure that we can have. And then he'll take like a, um, an orb, a a circle and put those together and, and talk about how in one, one, the the triangle would represent uh, finite. The circle represents infinite. And they're kind of marrying each other. So in one way, one represents heaven, one represents earth. So it's this, it's this um, coming together of the heaven and earth sort of a thing. And, and it does it through geometry. It does it through, you know, um, adding up the angles, um, doing division, pi, uh, you know, uh, those kinds of things. And you end up getting kind of these weird redundant numbers that just keep appearing over and over and over. Um, uh, Roswell was 1947, wasn't it? Right. And that's one of those numbers. Um, 2012 was one of those numbers. And he, you know, he was doing some stuff on what, what could be taking place in 2012 back in those days. And, mm-hmm. and what you find is that you just, you know, you just keep seeing these, these redundancies that take place mathematically, they take place geometrically, and then they take place in terms of like the size of the earth, the size of the moon, the distance of the earth to the sun, just all kinds of things. It just keep happening over and over and over again. And so when you start applying those things, yeah, go ahead, Jed. Sorry. I was just going to interject that another proportion that you often see is the uh, 1 to 1.6 ratio, the golden mean. Right. Uh, that's the proportions for humans. Yeah. You see the number 666 appear regularly, um, not in a kind of a, a um, how do I say this nicely, to, you know, just kind of the way that I grew up, 666 is this devil's number that you can't ever even say out loud or whatever. I have a funny story. I don't know if you guys have I've ever told you this, but um, I go to seminary and they sign our post office boxes. This is Denver Seminary. <laughs> and uh, I go to the lady and she goes, man, I got some good news and some bad news. She goes, Bad news is we really don't have any post office boxes left except one. <laughs> or no, no that, that's the good news. And then and she was the bad news, six. Oh, good. Uh, interesting. That they, I, I lost your audio just as you were uh, yeah. revealing the number of the yeah. post office box. But uh, can we assume yeah. it was so six? The post office box is, uh, she goes, the bad news is that the post office box is 666. <laughs> and she goes, do you want it? And I said, do I want it? That would be the greatest post office box ever for a seminary. And she's like, what? <laughs> she was the last three people I offered it to. They, they didn't want to have it at all. And I said, man, I'm not superstitious about this kind of stuff. So literally everything that I ever wrote for seminary had the number 666 on it. 
come to us. <laughs> Now, Jed, bringing bringing things back to your area of expertise there, or at least your your uh, field work there at uh, Benias, um, we know from Babylonian texts from the time of Abraham, the uh, old Babylonian copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, makes reference to that area as the secret dwelling of the Anunnaki. Now, Babylon is not exactly close to Mount Hermon. I mean, especially back in the day when you had to walk. You're talking about a four-month trip, but yet they knew that there was something about this mountain that was connected to uh, to what had formerly been the chief gods of Sumer, but uh, by the time of Abraham, they had sort of been demoted to becoming judges of the netherworld, which is really interesting because then you've got this dual meaning, uh, you know, Hermon, yes, where El has his abode with Asherah and his 70 sons, but also this connection to Bashan and the netherworld. Um what what is the history there? I mean, it, two thousand years before Jesus, the Babylonians considered it sacred. But uh, what what have archaeologists found? Well, actually, um, on Hermon, you're going to find a, a string of sites that actually date all the way back to uh, the Mesolithic and the Neolithic culture. There's a lot of uh, um, this. Uh, uh, late Stone Age culture called the Natufians, um, who actually built Jericho. Uh, they built the first uh, uh, settlement at Jericho. So they were all over the really they lived all over the Levant from Israel to Turkey. Um, some prominent sites to this day are the aforementioned Jericho and Tel Caramel and Syria and a myriad others. And you certainly find remnants of that that culture in the Mount Hermon environs and virtually every, every major historical period to follow. Uh, and much of that, uh, could be construed as ritual, so, you know, a ritual significance, some more than others. Um, but suffice to say, uh, it was a place where, uh, even in the old Testament, we know that the, the bales were worshiped on high places, on Herman, um, sometimes directly linking that bell to Herman, and, 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 as in the case of Bell Hermon, um, the Bell Gad being worshipped not not terribly far from there as well. Um, so, just in terms of, of diagnostic artifacts, you find a lot of stuff that really really chains the the supernatural uh, to the land. And that, that in and of itself is kind of the direction that I took with uh, uh, Peneus proper in my, in my dissertation, but in general, uh, that entire region. Which, of course, is uh, Bashan, which was the uh, kingdom of Og. And yes. uh, presumably there was some That's reason, the presumably there was a reason that God directed Moses and the Israelites to go there first and take out Og before coming back south to Jericho and crossing the Jordan. Exactly. And that in and of itself was not just a, a physical military move, it was also a supernatural move. But you're right. I mean, basically the corridor that you, interestingly enough, that you're going through, let's say you're making a trip from Babylon to uh, the Herman region, you're going to go through Bashan. And uh, the, the name... The name Bashan lingered quite long in the historical record. Um, it's sort of hidden in plain sight during the Roman era um, when it was Latinized as Britannia. Uh, but it's the same, the same region, the same province. There was a, a tetrarchy there ruled over by one of Herod, the great sons, Philip. Uh, and Basically, all of those those five little provinces um, made up the the older kingdom of Bashan, uh, and of course, those it's it's a storied place. You know, it's not just been the purview of biblical scholars. There have been anthropologists and and uh, folklorists of all kinds who have studied the oral tradition. It preserves a lot of a lot of entities and events that are eerily similar, in my opinion, virtually the same as those that are outlined in the ancient record and the biblical record. 
And it, it's interesting that we have this link, you know, between, I mean, there's been some good work done linking, uh, you know, the, that region to the, the Mesopotamian culture in general, not just the Sumerians. Um, but, you know, clearly, uh, within within the scope of what they considered sacred, that was sacred yard. Something I stumbled onto a couple of weeks ago, maybe I've shared this with you fellows already, but uh, I don't know if I brought this to the audience. The the region um, north of the Sea of Galilee and north and east, the ancient region of Bashan, um, was considered, uh, and we talked about this before, was considered really the entrance to the netherworld. And uh, archaeologically speaking, it's just covered with funerary monuments. These megalithic dolmens are just all over that region. There are more of them clustered there than pretty much anywhere on Earth. I mean, you find dolmens all over the planet, but uh, in the Jordan Valley and on the Golan Heights, the ancient region of Bashan, they're so close together that uh, an archaeologist for the Israel Antiquities Authority wrote, you can't use the term dolmen field anymore because you don't know where one ends and the other begins on the Golan. <laughs> um, you can plot them out on a map, and uh, if I remember, I'll put up the uh, screenshot here. I used this on a presentation a few years ago showing a location of the Dolman Fields, and you see this just big blob of red just to the north of the Sea of Galilee. And there was an ancient uh, Ugaritic myth called the Epic of Akat, where there's a reference in there, uh, the father uh, looking for his son who's been murdered at the uh, command of the war goddess, uh, says when he finds his son, he will mourn and he will bury him in a tomb for the underworld gods at Kinneret. Well, it's a reference to the Rephaim in the Sea of Galilee. So there was clearly something around the time of the judges based on this uh, epic that connected that region to the netherworld and to these spirits of the uh, the deified dead kings of old. But um, John chapter 1, verse 28 uh the Gospel of John, he records that uh, John the Baptizer uh, was uh, baptizing, uh, well, I'll, I'll quote the verse, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Bethany across the Jordan or Bethany beyond the Jordan. Um, the King James translate it, translates it as uh, Beth Abara. But uh, as far back as 1877, Claude Condor who was exploring the region for the Palestine Exploration Fund, along with uh, Charles Warren and others, um, suggested that uh, the Greek Beth- Bethania, or Bethania, that was translated as Bethany into English, was uh, the Judd, the Roman name that uh, you mentioned, uh, Beth- Bethania. Bethania. And when you look then at where... Jesus calls his first disciples, beginning at verse 35 of John chapter 1, standing with John, standing with two of his disciples, and Jesus uh, walks by. Behold, the Lamb of God, and Jesus turns and uh, saw them following, and uh, so they, they follow him. The next day he goes to the Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So you've got three guys there from Bethsaida, which is located just north of the Sea of Galilee. In other words, in Beth- Bethania. Bashan, and uh, I stumbled onto, uh, in researching Gilgal Rephaim, that big megalithic monument on the Golan Heights, there's another one that's about one-third the size, but it's the same, concentric rings around a central tumulus covering a dolmen overlooking the Jordan River. It's called Kerbet Beteha, and it's half a mile from, wow. from Beth Saida. It's just right off of the north end of the uh, sea, as I recall, isn't it? That's correct. And then when you go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, this is what blew my mind. Right. Um, uh, Matthew records the uh, calling of his first disciples, uh, beginning at verse 12 of Matthew 4. When he heard that John had been arrested, he, Jesus, withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, which is right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, right near where the Jordan River empties into the uh, sea. Uh, Lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. uh, And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death... On them a light has dawned. So Matthew saw Jesus relocating to the north shore of the Sea of Galilee in this region that was, that's to this day filled with dolmens, 
Not to mention that big megalithic structure right there uh, was a fulfillment uh, for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death. On them, a light has dawned. So I'd always taken that verse as being sort of metaphorical. Oh, yeah, Jesus, he overcame sin and death. Matthew connects this to the geographic location where he called his first disciples. Right. So are, is this biblical validation that there was such a thing as these areas that were connected to bad supernatural activity? I think I so. Mean, taken, in tandem, yeah. taken in tandem with what we know of other places that you know, are certainly more overt cases, I, I don't see why not. I mean, this is the beginning of his ministry, and then later in his ministry, of course, um, he went back to this region and went right to the foot of Mount Hermon uh, at Caesarea Philippi. So, and, and basically, it's like here, he declared war on the, the fallen realm, and then at Caesarea Philippi, three years later, he declared his divinity. Well, because he followed that with the transfiguration on Mount Hermon. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, there's all... All kinds of weird things that are going on here. Um, it, to me, I, in, in one way, I feel like like this is the climax of of our discussion because this is really the beginning of Psalm two and Psalm eighty two and the promises to the Messiah starting to come true. Um, I think for people uh, maybe to get a little bit more background, it it might be helpful to just kind of return for a minute. To something I, that I know a lot of my people were not familiar with in our church. And when I talked about it with them, they were just kind of blown away. Um, and this is the idea that going back again to the Deuteronomy 32 stuff, that God would give the sons of God a certain territory, certain, they would allot to them certain places. Okay. Um, Plato actually talks about this and says that uh, Hephaestus and Athena were given to Greece and Poseidon was given to Atlantis. That's he talks about that in that section of the Critias. But um, and this kind of goes back to some of the Flynn stuff. It's it's really uncanny and bizarre and strange how the ancient peoples would uh, label either label geographic features according to where they had fixed the longitude of the heavens. So, for example, uh, they would they traditionally they fixed the prime meridian on the dog star. Uh, and right above the dog star, uh, you have the twins. Um, I forget what they're called in the Zodiac. Gemini? Uh, yeah, the Gemini. Gemini. Right. And the Gemini are right over Europe, okay? At the foot of Europe, you have, um, they're standing in the sky, they're standing on the Milky Way, but if, if you go down into Europe, that becomes the boot, which is Italy. And then uh, the whole myth of Rome coming out of these Romulus and Remus, these twins, is completely related to the Gemini myth. Uh, You go down a little farther south into um, the northwestern part of Africa, and you have the Atlas Mountains. And this is where, uh, like uh, Plato and Homer, they they fix the idea that Atlas was holding up the earth, uh, the god Atlas, with the, with these pill, he's holding the pillars between heaven and earth at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, you go over farther to the east, and you've got the Taurus Mountains, and just so happens that if you go up to the sky above that, you have Taurus predominating over the sky there. You go down to uh, South America, um, to the city of Cusco, and you see that you know these crazy megalithic walls and stuff. Uh, when you go up to the and, and you get a bird's eye view of it, you see that they're actually making the form of a giant puma. And since they didn't have lions in South South America, they the closest they would have is a puma. Well, Leo is who predominates over the area that that way. Um, Mexican flag has uh, the e- the eagle pecking at the back of the of the serpent. Well, that just happens to be the constellation that's just under Virgo, who predominates over America. I mean, it's just really weird stuff. And the wow. whole ancient world is understanding that there are. And I don't know, I don't know, guys, how this works, but the constellations somehow have this effect on the particular part of the Earth that they're to. 
no doubt why God told Moses, beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that yep. the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so now if you take this idea that that the stars are somehow fixed to f- positions on the earth, and then you move that into uh, northern Israel, the land of Canaan, the land of uh, the Canaanites, the land of Lebanon, where they called themselves the uh, uh, which Phoenicians, the, the Phoenicians, the, the, not the Phoenicians, C- Sidonians, that's what they called themselves, that's the what Sidonians, the, the Sidonians, that's right. That's right. The, so the dog star, the idea of the dog there. There's there's all this kind of sky language that's going on there. And then you marry this to somehow Mount Hermon being this perfect latitude and longitude place where the watchers would choose to break between heaven and earth. And then you have what Judd's talked so much about, about this being also a gate down to the underworld. So you've got like portals that are going between the three realms on this very spot. Yeah. And you've got all weird... Um, heaven and earth imagery meeting together, and then these verses that you brought up, Derek. I mean, they're they're just hit spot on. That to me, what what's going on is that God had given these nations over to these uh, supernatural entities and put them in darkness, and that's the language of Matthew four there. That the light is going to shine in this darkness, and that He just so happens to choose this geographical place. It's not down in Jerusalem, you know, it's up there in the land of Bashan. It's up there in the land of, you know, all the way goes up. It really goes up to Sidon and Tyre. I mean, for whatever reason, he's, he's beginning this ministry to the Gentiles and he's beginning his reclamation prog- uh, program, not at the end of his ministry, but at the very beginning of his ministry. And like you said, then he goes back at the end of the transfiguration and he says, here I am, come and get me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's all this stuff is uh, it's just very significant to understand that there's there's much more going on here than just kind of a, a random picking. Well, he just happened to be born there, so I guess we'll start here or something like that. Yeah, Na- Nazareth is not exactly right next to the Sea of Galilee. He had to make a conscious choice to no. go from there up to Capernaum. If you look at a map, especially when you're walking. And, and I don't think it's been drilled into us enough that uh, the trip to Caesarea Philippi was a conscious decision too, because he had just come from Sidon, where he um, healed the, the Syrophoenician woman's daughter, right. and um, he went back to the region of the Sea of Galilee. Now, there's a, a road, the uh, Via Maris, that, uh, w- well, it's further south, but there's a road that runs from Tyre to Damascus, that runs right past um, Dan and Caesarea Philippi. And he could have just gone there. It's like, yeah, well, we're in the neighborhood. We'll just stop by here and do this thing. But instead, he went to the Sea of Galilee, which is 30 miles south. Now, you know, I remember from my Boy Scout days, we didn't hike 30 miles in a day very often. Uh, I doubt that he and the disciples did either. It was a couple days travel down, and then he did a bunch of stuff. And then he went back specifically for the uh, question, who do you say that I am? So again, this wasn't something, you know, as long as we're here, let's just stop over here at the, uh, you know, the, the pagan uh, tourist trap and, you know, put him on notice. He, he made a special trip there. And I've never heard anyone in church talk about this. It wasn't until I, well, Judd, until I heard you on the Dr. Future podcast talking about Caesarea Philippi. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned... Um, I suspect that, that Jesus' familiarity with the entire Galilee region had a lot to do with family profession. You know, he would have worked with his dad uh, on a number of projects. Uh, more than likely, the, the palace built at Decephorus for Herod Antipas uh, was probably amongst them. So, you know, he was in his home territory. Uh, um, and it's like I used to tell my students: never, never under underestimate the ambulatory nature of ancient peoples, just because they don't have mopeds and electric cars. Well, yeah, things things moved a lot farther than we uh, than we expect, but still, you had to be pretty determined because 
It's not like you could plan to yeah. stop at a Seven Eleven or a, a Wawa or whatever uh, on the way to you know grab a bottle of water and a snack bar. Uh, you had a plan when you were going to travel for a few days. Yeah. Do we have enough bread? Do we have enough yeah. water with us? Um, okay, everybody's sandals in good working order. All right, let's go. Um, so it was it was a deliberate. You know, there there was a specific purpose in mind, and uh, that's that's what's been lost in in the modern world because we we just sort of take for granted just in time delivery. Uh, they didn't have that back then. Um, right. I guess that brings to mind another question: and why Sinai? No nope. papers. Sorry about that. <laughs> Not a broadcast until somebody's alarm is going off. <laughs> yeah, no idea what that was. Um, I think that was my logos. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the happy sound of Lagos opening. Um, <laughs> what you know? Why Mount Sinai? That uh, the uh, Har Elohim, this mountain of the gods uh, in in the south. Why didn't God just um, send Moses and the Israelites right to Mount Hermon right right from the start? I mean, they were right there. They just defeated the army of Og. Why not just keep going there? I mean, you know, they, I know they had to re- reveal stuff in the south before they went further north, but. They they didn't set up the kingdom there. They could have, you know, Hotsor was up there. They could have attacked Hotsor in that region and taken out the the, the main Canaanite kingdom in the north. But instead, he brought him back south again. Um, but again, this is after uh, God revealed Himself and His name to Moses at at Sinai. So, you know what what there you know what's there? Well, why was Babel something that God had to put a stop to over in uh, you know Sumer? What, 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 it, again, I'm just, I, I don't have answers to these questions. They, they are fascinating. It's really interesting to speculate, you know, what was going on in these locations that required God's personal intervention or that he directed his faithful followers to, you know, attend to them. Um, again, it's so just, let, let me give you a little bit of spec, the total, total speculation okay, on my part, but it's something I've looked into a little bit and it kind of touches on both of these places and it goes back to Abraham. So I don't know if you guys have heard uh, this or not. Uh, this comes from a study that I did on Islam uh, a few years back. And I was reading a book from a fellow who wrote a book called Munotheism. And his yes. basic thesis is that Allah was uh, basically the moon god that was taken out of a pantheon and then exalted to the place of the Most High. Okay, so the moon god's name was Sin. Mm-hmm. S-I-N is how we usually pronounce it. And so the root of that, uh, we find it in like the wilderness of sin right. or in Mount Sinai. And so just kind of a thought here. We know, and I think Jed, Jed and I were talking about this other night with Abraham. Um, and he can speak more to this because he's done some good work on it. But, you know, when we first meet Abraham in Genesis 11, you've got these family names. And several of these names are actually related to moon god worship. And so you come to Joshua 24, and it tells us that uh, Terah was a worshiper of other Elohim. And somehow God took Terah and his family out, and they bring, you know, the point was to bring them to Canaan, but they didn't do that. They stopped in Haran. And Haran is like this major Mecca center for moon god worship. Right, yes. Next and to Ur, so, Ur and Haran yeah. were the two main moon god worship centers in the uh, ancient right. Near East. That's right. So what if that, you know, your question first was about Sinai. Um, what if there's something else God has to deal with first, uh, which is dealing with a different deity over in Sinai? He's already dealt with the gods of Egypt, okay? So he's the, the ten plagues are, uh, of Egypt are dealing with different gods is kind of the basic idea that I've I've run into. And he shows himself victorious over all of them. And then all of a sudden he brings them into the middle of the moon god desert. Yeah. You know, to the top of this moon god mountain. And he says, no, this is my mountain. And then you got this weird language in like Psalm 68 that brings both Hermon and Sinai together. Like, why are yes. you so envious, Hermon, at the place that I chose for my abode over here at Mount Sinai? <laughs> you know, that's really weird stuff. So what if God is doing something all the way back, even in the days of giving the law to Moses, that is dealing somehow with the moon god. Uh, and then the same idea could be true of Babel, uh, you know, especially if it's connected somehow to Ur or, you know, a, but that could certainly become something completely different in terms of different entity. But I'm just saying the idea of 
going from one place to another place to show himself being the god of all gods mm-hmm. makes an awful lot of sense of kind of the the places that he chose to take these people that just seem like why why are you doing this so i don't know judd you probably have a lot more to talk about with than that but well i mean yeah I, the point you made the other night when we were talking about this it's really interesting that it would make sense if if tara and abraham were sort of in the priestly hierarchy um you know of, the, of that particular cult and they kind of worked their ways up and then God gives them the revelation that they can't unsee, uh, and calls them calls them out of it. Um, I, I in, in in my mind, it simply adds the adds to the significance of the role that Anatolia played in the biblical world, which is hardly ever put to the fore. Yes. And for it's, those it's, who don't know what Anatolia is, where's Anatolia? That's Turkey. That's modern day Turkey. Looks like a big turkey wing. <laughs> that's you why know, Sharon named one of her main it's... That's why Sharon named one of her main supernatural well, characters in the Red Wing saga, Anatole. <laughs> Anatole. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, from Genesis to Revelation, I mean yeah. Uh, Turkey is extremely prominent uh, as the province of Asia uh, in Revelation and in the, the New Testament letters in general. Um, and any uh, references to the Hittites uh, and any myriad of city states that exist there can be found throughout the Old Testament as you guys know. Um, but here's, I, another I side was, for you. Here's, a, here's another side note for you while you're talking about. Um, Turkey, and this deals in in Revelation. Um, there's good reason, I think, to believe that the seven cities of Revelation, where the seven churches were, were actually configured in such a way as to emulate the seven sisters in heaven. <laughs> so they actually what? put them as a mirror to one another. Really? So now go go and read Revelation chapter one. Uh, and go into chapter two and three with that in your mind, and it and it kind of puts a different spin on it. Wow. <laughs> yep. So that, but that's just more of this idea of of the marriage of the heaven to the earth. Well, you know, and I, I so. and I and I want to come back to you, Judd, because of the research you've been doing on Gobekli Tepe. But uh, I I wrote about this in a Bad Moon Rising, uh, which was about the supernatural forces behind Islam. I, I don't think Abraham came from Sumer, but even if he did, uh, he wound up in the other city. If he came from Ur, which was uh, sacred to Sin, so was Haran, where he ended up before coming to, uh, before coming to Canaan. But uh, the, uh, the Amorite name for the moon god was Yerik, and Jericho is named for the moon god. So the first city they took out after defeating Og and Sihon of Heshbon was crossing the river to take out the city of the moon god. Here's here's another weird one for that. So uh, I forget the exact number. So if I had a calculator, I could tell you. But they circumnavigate the city six times and then seven times, right? Right. Well, if you take the seven times 360, you end up getting, uh, I think it's 2,160 is the number. Okay, so that's the 360 degrees times seven. You get that number. And that just so happens to be, believe it or not, drum roll, the, I think it's the diameter of the moon. <laughs> in miles, <laughs> and they and they and they would have known this because of sacred um, geometry. What's even more interesting is that the, uh, 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 well, or rather, another interesting aspect of choosing that particular method to destroy the city of the moon god was that uh, the uh, the march around Jericho began right after the Passover, which is on the fourteenth of Nisan. So it began. Their, their march began on the 15th, which was the on a 30-day lunar calendar. That's when the moon is full. So they began marching while the moon was full around the city of the moon god. But this was also the time of year when uh, the annual Akitu festival was celebrated in the ancient Near East, which was a uh, sort of a New Year's festival. Some cities celebrated in the spring, others in the fall. But the earliest known celebration of the Akitu festival, which involved uh, bringing the idol 
that represented the god from the city and setting him outside the city in a special house, the Akitu house, for this massive festival. And people would bring their tithes and offerings and they would have rituals. And, and then they would bring the god back into the city uh, in this big procession, you know, bring him back into his temple. Uh, the earliest known celebration of this was Ur which was the city sacred to the moon god. Uh, this is somewhere around 2500 BC. But uh, and now and we don't know from any texts found at Jericho or if there were any texts found at Jericho. I, to be honest, I'm not even aware of that, but uh, it's not known whether this was celebrated at uh, Jericho or not, but the timing of it certainly matched the timing of the festival at other cities in the ancient near east, which might explain why um, in the book of Joshua it says that people were afraid to, you know, no one went out and no one came in. Because that was the whole point of the Akitu festival, this going out and coming in, bringing the god out in a procession on the first day of the uh, the festival. Uh, oh, and part of that festival, that the ritual, one of the rituals they know of from uh, ancient Ur was circumambulating the fields, marching in a circle around the fields to raise a hedge of protection uh, for the crops against the uh, the demon winds that would uh, you know destroy their crops. So 2,000 plus years later, the Israelites are marching around the city of Jericho uh, when, according to the texts that have been found from various gods in various cities in ancient Mesopotamia, typically it was the seventh day of the festival when they'd have the big procession to bring yeah. the god back into the city. And that was the day yeah. when the walls of Jericho fell. Yeah, there's a god coming into the city here, just not the one you want. Yeah. yeah, and like I said, that's all numbers that's related to the moon. In fact, you see this uh, uh, in uh, Mecca today around the Kaaba, mm -hmm. where Muslims are going around the Kaaba over and over and over, emulating uh, the revolution of the uh, the planets around the central place of worship. You know, so you know. And again, like we were talking earlier, Allah, if he's a moon god, it's it's all related. So. Right. Uh Sir Charles Warren, who I mentioned earlier, who was one of these explorers in the 1860s and 70s, uh, sent by the Palestine Exploration Fund. And this was partly for the archaeology, but partly because the PEF was also reporting to the, uh, the Foreign Office in, uh, in London because the Ottoman Empire was collapsing. And so the Brits and the French and the Germans wanted to see which pieces of the Middle East they could get. Uh, Sir Charles Warren. Voila. Yeah. So, yeah exactly. <laughs> Uh, climbed Mount Hermon in September of 1869, and he found that uh, stone in the summit, uh, in, in the temple on the summit of Mount Hermon. But leading up to the summit itself, um, which was uh, like a, scooped out like a big bowl for uh, libations, drink offerings, there was a low stone wall that he said it was much older than that temple that forced you to approach the summit with the summit on your left. In other words, you had to approach the summit in a counterclockwise fashion. Huh. So huh. Warren in 1869 said, um, you know, uh, we're told by the, uh, what do they call them? The Mohammedans or the Muslim I forget which term he used, the archaic form for Muslim, that uh, they believe that there are sacred stones from a number of mountains in the uh, Kaaba, including uh, the Mount of Olives, uh, let's see, Mount, uh, Mount Ararat, Mount Carmel, uh, Jebel al-Nur, which was where Muhammad reportedly got his uh, visitation, uh, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and um, Mount Hermon. And so, Herm so it was a war and wondered, is it possible that the, uh, what they call the tawaf, the, the circula circling of the Kaaba, actually began as a ritual on Mount Hermon? That's, uh, that's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't it though? You know, I, now here's here's something else. Uh, there's a, a Canadian historian by the name of Dan Gibson who has uh, produced uh, a documentary based on a book that he's written called uh, "The Sacred City," and he argues that Mecca of Muhammad, so Muhammad who lived in the seventh century and created this religion that now has 1.6 billion adherents around the world, was actually not in Arabia but was at Petra, and he shows that uh, based on the Qibla, which is the direction of prayer in the oldest existing mosques, which uh, date back to the 7th century, including one in Canton, China, which blows my mind, um, huh. that the Qibla, which is supposed to point toward Mecca, points to within a two degree uh, average uh, deviation of plus or minus two degrees, which is astonishing because they didn't have compasses back then. 
So they were doing this by dead reckoning from the stars. The Kibla points to Petra. I mean, it's known from the, uh, uh, the Quran that Muhammad changed the direction of prayer um, at some point, I think 10 or 12 years into his uh, faith, because he got angry at the Jews who were laughing at Muhammad. He didn't even know the direction to pray until we told him. He said, okay, fine. So he turned his back on Jerusalem, and it was assumed that he changed the direction to, to Mecca. But the earliest, the earliest existing mosques, the oldest existing mosques, argue against that because they don't point anywhere near Mecca. They point to Petra which we know was a, uh, a pagan um, tourist destination, a pagan, uh, no, it's not tourist, that's the word I'm looking for, pilgrim. But people would make pilgrimage to Petra. There are over 500 idols that have been found carved into the walls of Petra. Um, so it was as much a pagan destination as uh, Caesarea Philippi was. Um, Certainly. Is it possible that there's something spiritual and supernatural about Petra as well? I'm, I, Sharon and I are operating under a working theory that we have to research before we're prepared to defend this theory. We think Sinai is there. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I know that there's that mountain in, in Arabia, the uh, uh, Jebel Allahs, that has that split rock on the top. Right. But... Right. Um, Consider when you're trying to water two million people plus their flocks and herds. Um, if you've ever seen Petra or been to Petra and you've gone through the uh, uh, the Seek, which is that that chasm that you have to go through to get down to the Treasury Building, uh, it, the the mountain literally split in half to make that opening. And until the Nabataeans in the second century BC diverted the wadi that ran right through their town, it would, it would basically flood the city. But uh, even to this day, when it rains real hard in Jordan, you can get floodwaters coming out of the Sikh that are dangerous enough that tourists are running for their lives to get away from it. So just imagine yeah. if that was the rock that Moses struck with his staff, and boom, they, the locals still call that wadi, Wadi Musa, or the Wadi, wadi of Moses. Wadi al Musa, that's right. Yeah, I was about to say, there's still a hmm. lot of local it supports that the association with Moses, the staff that he used to, to do that with, and water in general are, are common motifs and stories associated with that place. That's really interesting. I ne I never considered that. Uh, there was a German yeah, neither. A German archaeologist who who tried to make that case back in 1922, about a hundred years ago, and I've not found his a copy of his book. I'd like to read his research, but. Uh, um, it's believed that Aaron, uh, that Mount, uh, Hor, where, where Aaron is buried is, uh, located right there. You can, you can see it as you're driving into Petra. It's a tough climb to get to it, but, uh, there's still a shrine up there for Aaron. So, um. Now, I don't remember this from the movie, uh, but when, uh, Indiana Jones goes to Petra, you know, and it's not really Petra in the movie, but doesn't, isn't that like the whole, uh, canyon area there? Doesn't it look like a crescent moon in the movie? <laughs> it's, yeah, in the movie, it does, yeah. Uh, in the movie, yeah. I, I don't know, know what it was called that movie, The Canyon of the Crescent Moon. Huh. That's right. The Canyon of the Crescent Moon. Yeah. I have not looked at that, but uh, <laughs> it, it is it is really interesting. And there, in fact, there's a, uh, a temple for the chief god of the Nabataeans uh, down the end of the colonnaded street, the, the, you know, when they, the Romans got in there and they, or the Nab maybe the Nabataeans put up the colonnades. Uh, they, they were big fans of Greek architecture. Um, the temple of their chief god had a big cube in the front, uh, in the forecourt of the temple. And in fact, hmm. some of the, uh, the funerary monuments, when you're walking into, when you, before you get to the Sikh, between the, uh, the main entrance and the Sikh, they've got these big funerary monuments that are big, cubes um that they call uh gin blocks now the nabataeans didn't call them that because the word gin was not part of arabic in the you know second century bc or whatever um but uh, it appears that uh, their chief god dushara was worshipped in the form of a cube and uh, there's a belief that perhaps the uh, fourth century bishop epiphanius on the island of um cyprus who was writing about the uh, some of the pagan beliefs that still existed around the Mediterranean, 
uh, wrote about the uh, the worship of Kore, which is uh, Persephone, the uh, goddess who spent half of her year in the underworld and half the year above. And there was a, a ritual at Alexandria where they would bring the idol representing Kore out and they would walk in a circle around the sacred place before returning her down below. And he said, in a similar way, the Nabataeans worship their god born of a virgin. But it appears he confused the Arabic word for virgin, which is Ka'iba, and the word for cube, which is Ka'aba. Mm. Uh, so anyway, this fellow, Dan Gibson, uh, viewers, if you're interested in checking this out, I think the documentary is still available on Amazon Prime, The Sacred City. He really does a good job, I think. Um, he's sympathetic. Okay. It's not like he wants to tell Arab, Muslims rather that they're doing the wrong thing. He just wants them to know their actual history. I don't know that he's made any headway, but uh, it's really fascinating, especially if you put any stock in the the prophetic implications of uh, Petra perhaps being a place prepared in the wilderness to hide Israel in the last days. But yeah, that's... Oh, and also, footnote, footnote to listeners and viewers, Epiphanius is worth the read. He was, uh, yeah, it was really interesting. I was startled when I stumbled across that. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not the first one to put forward this this theory about Petra uh, and especially connecting it to um, the Muslims. Again, Dan Gibson uh, in The Sacred City, he gets the credit for uh, uh, for that. But when you start looking at other evidence, it's known that, well, Muhammad's family came from that area. So again, getting back to our theme, if if you believe that there are certain areas that are more supernaturally uh, magnetic than others, wouldn't uh-huh. it be wouldn't it be interesting if that was the location where God gave the law to Moses, and then Muhammad later founded his own religion to try to, you know, under the influence of the fallen realm, to try to destroy it? Right. It fits with the whole theme and the whole idea of it. Speculation. Yeah. Yep. But it in, for informed speculation. I mean, it's not yep. as if we're yeah. turning darts blind. Uh, Even if it was wrong, it would be speculation that um, is analogous to what we're talking about. So it can help you at least understand more of what we're talking about. So, And I guess the other question, and we, maybe we should just focus on this for the final uh, segment here of our discussion tonight. Why Zion? Why Jerusalem? Why the Temple Mount? Go for it, Judd. <laughs> um, well, when you consider that Jerusalem uh, has a number of layers of occupation, um, I suspect that, that that has a lot to do with it, considering that, you know, we had Jebusites and Canaanites. And <clears throat> virtually every every ethnicity in the Levant had had a presence there at some point in time. And they worshipped their gods there, too. Um, so I suspect it was such a concentrated spot that this was sort of like planting the flag uh, right in the middle. Now, there are some other people who claim that, um, that uh, Eden uh, was located uh, in, in the vicinity or actually on the mountain. Um, but clearly, clearly there was, there was sacred geography at work here because that's where that this, this is the place where the, the temple was chosen. Uh, and really the, and the political center of the, the kingdom of uh, Israel and then Judah. There were several places where the tabernacle was located prior to the temple's construction in Jerusalem. Um, obviously, it was with Moses and the Israelites at uh, Sinai when they crossed the river. It was at um, uh, Shechem for quite some time. And there's really interesting history around Shechem as well. Um, and the reason that Joshua put his altar there uh, in the story of uh, Gideon's son, uh, Abimelech, who rebelled against Gideon, and then the rebellion of the people who helped him rebel. There's a, a mention of a company of people coming down from the Diviner's Oak, which is probably the Oak of More, which is uh, on a hill just to the northeast of the city of Nablus today, uh, and across the valley from the location of Joshua's altar. 
And then that moved to Shiloh. The tabernacle moved to Shiloh. And interestingly, the Samaritans think that uh, they preserve they preserve the legitimate law of Moses and that uh, Eli, the priest who raised Samuel, illegitimately and illegally took the tabernacle and ran and set it up at Shiloh as an alternate religion. So the Samaritans think they've got the law, the Jews have it wrong, and Christians are just right out, which is why we've got um, that mention in uh, the Gospels of uh, Jesus and the woman at the well. So you Jews worship on your mountain, our fathers we worship here, because they think their mountain is the sacred mountain, Mount Gerizim. So, uh, and then you got Shiloh, where the tabernacle stood for 360 some years before everything moved to Jerusalem. So again, it's just kind of a puzzle why this this move. But the scriptures are pretty clear that Zion is where God says His name will dwell forever. I mean, I think we we know that we have to go back to at least the days of Abraham because uh, this is where the foreshadowing of the crucifixion takes place with uh, Isaac on Mount Moriah. Right. I mean, it's right there, the very same place. So. I mean, that doesn't really answer the question, because that just begs the question of why would God want him to go there? But at least we can see that uh, if this goes all the way back to early Genesis. For yeah, I think we've lost a Doug is frozen again, which uh, he warned us about at the beginning of the discussion tonight. Oh, now you're back. Yep. I go out for about 10 seconds, like every 10 minutes. I don't know what's going on. It's the deep state. <laughs> the deep state. <laughs> or perhaps the deeper state, the uh, principalities and powers. Well, we've, uh, <laughs> let's see, let me check the time here on this. And we've been talking for nearly an hour. Wow, this has gone by very, very quickly. And uh, I don't know that we've answered anything other than to just uh, agree, I think, that uh, there are certain areas in this world that are uh, more significant spiritually and always have been. And certainly I would suggest that the uh, political tension, which is a nice way of saying the uh, occasional violence around the Temple Mount suggests that there's more to it than just uh, a, a political fight over who gets to control that 35-acre piece of ground. Mm -hmm. Clearly. Yeah, I mean, those, those sa the sacred uh, geometry, the sacred s space, you know, whatever you want to talk about, it, uh, it doesn't go away. Uh, but I would say that, it, that, you know, the thing I would want to leave people with is just the promises of Messiah that if 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 all these different areas of the of the globe have these special places that people always recognize, they put their sacred structures on them. The point of the gospel is that Christ is taking back all of it because yeah. his is the earth and the promise was given that he would inherit the nations. And, you know, go back to the again, Matthew four. Why does he start there? And why is it why does it matter that he's talking about? The Galilee of the Gentiles. I mean, I thought his ministry was to the Jews, first to the Jews. But here he starts with the Gentiles. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. Well, and, 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 and it's fulfilling and, the Messianic promises. And Matthew is very specific in saying it's across the Jordan. So yeah, it was yeah. east of the Jordan, which was that land that uh, in his day and in ancient times was part of that kingdom of Bashan that was literally the entrance to the netherworld. I mean, if he was, uh, if he was Elisha and Naaman... You would think that he would have, he would have done it on the other side, right? He would have done it in the land of Canaan, in the land of Israel, but he doesn't do it. He goes to the, he goes outside of that to the area of the unclean and the dead and the, all these kinds of things, for his to be in his priestly ministry of cleansing the earth, and it's a it's a really beautiful picture. Yeah, yeah. Well, once again, scripture more literal than uh, most of us were taught coming up. So. Uh, it's just why this this is so fascinating and why I appreciate uh, having you guys as friends able to sh just share these ideas and thoughts and uh, pray that these are a blessing to people who uh, who see and hear these programs. Uh, pastor Doug Van Dorn, he is a pastor of the Reformed Baptist Church, Northern Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. His website is douglasvandorn.com. And Dr. Judd Burton, director of the Institute of Biblical Anthropology, online tioba.org and burtonbeyond.com. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, we'll have uh, Brian back with us next time, God willing, and we look forward to doing this again. Always fun. Again, check the show notes for the links to Judd and Doug's websites. We'll even include a link to uh, 
to Brian Godawa's website, even though he is uh, sadly not with us this week, uh, this month. But uh, we will be back again in the month of August with another conversation. We're going to kick around some ideas and uh, hopefully, uh, again, get into some speculative theology but uh, always trying to bring it back around to uh, to the Bible. Thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to this podcast, following us on social media. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at View From Bunker, my personal Twitter account at Derek Gilbert. Facebook, we got a page there, View From the Bunker. And on Truth Social, Gab Me, we get our parlor at Derek P. Gilbert. And of course, our YouTube channel. If you're watching this on video, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gilbert House. But better yet, get our free mobile app. That way you bypass the gatekeepers of social media. If we should happen to, uh, you know, say something that uh, they don't like, as uh, we have had a few of these uh, videos yanked by YouTube, we've got a strike against us for uh, an interview, one interview so far this year, but uh, you can avoid that. You make sure you don't miss a show by getting the Gilbert House app. You'll find it at gilberthouse.org slash app, gilberthouse.org slash app. You can also add us to Roku or Apple TV, the link there as well. And we're going to go back and start adding some of the audio archives from a view from the bunker to the uh, apps so that uh, all of those archives are available that way as well, because... Um, first, uh, oh, I don't know, seven years of the program, this was audio only. We've got literally hundreds of interviews in audio form. You can find them at the website, of course, vftb.net, also at our Spreaker page, but uh, we're going to put those over on the mobile app and the, and the, uh, the Roku channel as well, because a lot of good content. And that's not, you know, me bragging about myself. It's just, I've been blessed to have talked to a lot of really interesting and really intelligent people since we began this program back in 2009. A couple of quick notes. Uh, we mentioned Turkey, Anatolia in the program. The uh, tour that we had planned for Turkey this fall, we've decided to push off to 2023 for a couple of reasons. Um, the economy, not great right now, but mostly because of the political situation in Eastern Europe. Russia and Lithuania, Russia and NATO getting fussy with each other. And if things should happen to break out between now and uh, September, Turkey's a NATO member. And they might be drawn into something that uh, we don't want to be anywhere near. So we're going to push this back to 2023 and pray that cooler heads prevail between now and then. Also working on getting a couple of special guests to join us. In addition to Doug Hershey, author of Israel Rising and Jerusalem Rising, the founder of Ezra Adventures, uh, working with him to reschedule the dates for October of 2023. We'll get those dates specifically nailed down by January. We will, however, be in Israel March 19th through 30th of 2023. 2023. Find out more online. We've got a new tour page at uh, our Gilbert House app, or Gilbert House website, rather, gilberthouse.org slash travel. gilberthouse.org slash travel. Information about our Israel tour coming up in March. Uh, Rabbi Zev Porat joining us from Tel Aviv and uh, seeing many of these sites, including Gilgal Rephaim, the Serpent Mound of Bashan, and of course the places you want to see, like Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, the Temple Mount. We will visit as many of these uh, battle sites as we can. Mount Nebo, called in the Bible the Mountain of the Avarim, Mountain of the Travelers. What does that mean? And why is it prophetically significant? This will be like a rolling conference through the Holy Land, and uh, we've got information online. GilbertHouse.org slash travel with links there to uh, the place where you can reserve your spot. Um, don't miss the uh, Go Therefore conference. That's coming up in just a couple of weeks now. Uh, that is the last weekend in July, the 19th, or rather the 29th through the 31st, 29th through the 31st, um, Friday and Saturday, I believe that's the 29th and 30th. Let me uh, check those dates. Where's my calendar? There we go. Yes, uh, 29th and 30th will be the presentations. Um, and uh, you can... Uh, join us yet this will be at uh, the harvest revival center in brookville uh, ohio that's just outside dayton find out more online at go therefore conference.com go therefore conference.com um, great speakers what a great lineup pastor mike spaulding pastor carl gallops pastor casper mcleod dr michael lake david hevner coach dave kenny c dr sherry tenpenny uh, yeah, quite a uh, diverse gathering. Don't miss this. Tom Dunn talking about the uh, spiritual warfare where um, 
the rubber meets the road in spiritual warfare. Uh, Pastor Neil Peterson of uh, Harvest Ra- Revival Center hosting. And uh, again, go thereforeconference.com. Yes, streaming video is available. If you can't travel, uh, do take advantage of this one. This is uh, this is quite a gathering, and we're looking forward to getting together with uh, all of our friends there. Uh, Mid-September, a conference in Live Oak, California, near Yuba City, the Dark Secrets Bright Hopes Conference. I'll be speaking alongside L.A. Marzulli and Timothy Alberino and uh, get you details on where to sign up for that as soon as that information is available. Again, thanks for listening or watching wherever you're doing it. Uh, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever else you find us, which is wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our announcer is DC Good. And a view from the bunkers, a production of Gilbert House Ministries, to le- released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker.